the good old times. We often sigh for the good old times when observing the trend today, recalling only the things we loved that have changed or passed away. The good old times when the shops were filled with all you could wish to buy, and you noticed how cheaply the goods were priced as you passed with a long an eye. There was always the problem of ways and means, and the struggle of making mend, though a pound would go a long way then if you had but a pound to spend. Often we had a scheme and plan how best to make ends meet when there often seemed more backs than shirts and far less shoes than feet. Then saffron was cheaper than bacca now. Bacca was cheap as chalk, yet many would draw on an empty pipe because they couldn't afford to smoke. Yet we were thankful for mercy small, just a plain and fulsome feed, a coat to wear and a bed at night would suffice our humble need. Though the dinners were good I must allow, uh, there was none of your drabs and dribs, but a belly full of this sort of stuff that would help to support your ribs. A heap and pan of water or fry, or a dish of steaming stew, and a good salt iron wouldn't bad along with a spud or two. But a pasty was always a favoured meal, or oh, a sight for hungry eyes, for whatever was lacking in fat and lean was well made up in size. And happy times the women had when they met on a shearing night, with a mugs of tea and a bit of rich hot heavy touched up light. Then when things were passing fear, if you know like what I mean, they'd sport an extra at me age and rise to a nog of cream. Ah, the good old times. But we had our laughs and managed to weather through, thankful alike for health and strength and a berth with a willing crew. We'd fish the seasons through the year, from mackerel in the spring, and often in the summertime the cobbled streets would ring with cries of, Heather, Heather, and young and old would run, help about the pilchards being hauled in by the ton. And some would set a distant course and yearly venture forth, equipped with heronets and gear, to Ireland or the north. Then season up and summer spent on smeat and spear, we'd stand to welcome home the little ships as they returned to land. The boys would run to grab the bags as feather stepped ashore, with visions of a bust-up time on Scarborough Rock galore. Grandfather would have a new clay pipe and a heavy art of twist. It took a bit of thinking out that nobody was missed. When all the fleet were gathered home, twas just an artist's dream. To view the luggers lying there and riding beam to beam in waters quiet, clear and blue. Beneath a sunny sky, to whose warm influence the sails were loosely spread to dry. We had no picture houses then, no electric light. No wireless sets to listen to when settled in at night. But then you never miss the things you've neither had nor seen. Nor can we claim that life today is any more serene than was the case in days gone by. Maybe we even find that much of that which we extol has cost our peace of mind. So when in terms of progress we refer to former days and deprecate the simple things in strange old-fashioned ways, just think of values deep and true, that maybe, after all, you'll find in things that matter most, life hasn't changed at all. Near enough. We measured the length of the boundary line with a couple of pegs and a ball of twine. That's near enough, says I. Near enough, when do, says he. It must be as exact as exact can be. Tis exact, says I. You can come and see. That's near enough, says he. Time. My name is Time. I hold in my embrace the outer reaches of a boundless space. Of countless ages past and yet to be, all have their fleeting incidents in me. The infinitely great, the micro-small, the like are mine for I encompass all. I saw the stars in all their glory born, was there to see the solar system form, beheld the cooling of a fiery earth, and witnessed to the miracle of birth. Then transcending all, the rise of man revealed a new dimension in the plan of life's progression, stretching on before horizons new to conquer and explore were brought to view, while ever and anon the struggle to survive goes on and on. And so from crude abode in tree and cave, and slender craft to breast the shallow wave, 
Man primitive aspired with pride and zeal to stately homes and massive ships of steel. From tribal rights and superstitious awe to empires won and held by rule of law, a cruel law which made of power its god, exalted strength and on the weaker trod, of justice void to mercy unbeknown. Thus were the rancid seeds of hatred sown, their roots to spread and wander wide and deep, that generations yet unborn must reap the bitter harvest of despotic greed. Thus every war implants a poison seed that denigrates the race, to yield at last the ultimate in crime, the deadly blast of mutilative atomistic power. No man may know the fateful day or hour, when taut and nerve and sanity may snap, when fear may lose its power to bridge the gap twixt life and death. What matters in defeat? The tyrant seeks the path of no retreat and gives the final order of command. All earth becomes a devastated land. Soft breaks the dawn where spreads the eastern glow. Fresh blows the breeze, the tides still ebb and flow. Bright shines the sun by day, and through the night the silent moon distills her mellow light upon a lifeless world. Thus ends the plan of all those wild, conflicting dreams of man. Heed then the signs, all things exist in me, though only you may choose what they shall be. And while you pause, already on the brink, just bear in mind, it's later than you think. Faith's Renewal You know when winter comes that for a while one may not see the warm and friendly smile of life as in the splendour of its bloom. And though the face of nature may assume with falling leaf an aspect gaunt and bare, there is no cause nor reason for despair. The broad depletive features of decline may in appearance represent a sign of universal dying. Even so, the vital force of life will ever flow beyond the seeming blight of winter's sting to glad fulfilment in the joy of spring. Seems strange thus in preconscious life to find the hidden purpose of creative mind. Still more incredible to postulate from automatic processes a state of being neither preconceived nor planned. So little do we truly understand. An isolated acorn in a storm is severed from its parent oak and shorn of all protection from the wintry blast. Born on the wind it comes to rest at last within a tiny crevice in the earth. A stately tree has found its place of birth. While latent in each wonder-working cell, the future rests secure and all is well. Toward the end of the last century, the entire St. Ives police force consisted of one full-time officer, Mr. Bennett, and a part-time assistant. Off the record. Industrious, thrifty, and wanting a job, yet lacking the main store and even a bob. A wife and three children, a roof and a bed, but the cupboard was empty, yes, even of bread. That in a nutshell was Benjamin's plight as he crept into field on a cold winter's night. The farmer was taking his usual walk just prior to retiring. He tended his stock and was crossing the yard to his fireside again when he paused to consider the weather. And then he seemed to detect a slight scurrying sound from that part of the field where the turnips were found. So scanning the patch he discerned, sure as fate, the form of a man, he was climbing the gate. It was useless to chasten and futile to shout. So he conquered the impulse, and turning about, went into his missus and told what he saw. They agreed this was clearly a case for the law. Poor Ben tramped the country from Trumwith to Gew, just looking and longing for something to do. Then daily returned from his weary inquest, all spent and embittered, and sorely depressed. One night he said, Seems to me, Martha, my maid, it's turn up to nothing again, I'm afraid. He little suspected when near in the field that a figure was quietly standing, concealed just across from the gate, for he hadn't a clue that the law was alerted and following through on the farmer's report. So, turnips in sack, he returned to his home with the law at his back. Mr. Bennett, for that was the constable's name, having noted the house to which Benjamin came, hung around for a while, twenty minutes or more, then went into action, knocked on the door. 
It was Martha who answered the summons, and then, Mr. Bennett is here. Better speak to him, Ben. Come in, Mr. Bennett. Come in. Take a chair. Put the children to bed, will you, Martha, my dear? They talked on together as only men can who respect one another, and so man to man the story was told. And after a while, Mr. Bennett remarked with a trace of a smile, When I followed you home, Ben, and got to your door, I just hung around till I felt pretty sure that you'd all had your suppers. And now I must go, but you'll see me again in an hour or so. The law's the law, though I pity your plight, and my only concern is to do what is right. So the cupboard departed, his heart strangely stirred by the scene he had witnessed. The story he'd heard of conflicting emotions and loyalty strained. But the law was the law, and his duty remained to his cloth and his calling. Yet did not St. Paul, among virtues, name charity greatest of all? Thus pondering deeply the problem on hand, he was soon among men who could well understand all the heartbreak of poverty. Some even then were but little removed from the plight of poor Ben. But they acted in charity, honoured the creed, and would share of their last with a stranger in need. No name had been mentioned, nor any required, to achieve the result Mr. Bennett's desired. So, with cash in his pocket and joy in his heart, he made for the grocer's. Then, adding his part, conferred with the other how best he should spend this bountiful gift on behalf of the friend. There was bread in abundance with treacle and jam, fresh eggs and a generous helping of ham, a packet of tea and a great hunk of cheese, and some cheap in the drawer for the kids, if you please. Then the shopkeeper's wife, bless her heart, copped the lot with a nice saffron cake. What a beautiful thought. Poor Martha and Ben. Such a horrible gloom seemed to over about them in that little room. Just fancy, said Ben, all this better to do for the want of the price of a rooty or two. Then footsteps were heard on the cobbles outside. Be prepared for the worst, my dear, Martha replied. Far be it from me to attempt to intrude on that intimate scene, on the joy that ensued, as the copper like Santa Claus, beaming and bright, dropped in with his blessing from out of the night. It's good to receive, but as true as I live, it's much better, he thought, if you're able to give. I'm glad to report that in charity's cause no record appeared in the book of the laws, for the farmer was ready and glad to concede to the claims of distress. Though a person in need had been wiser, he thought, to have made a request than so burden his conscience and risk an arrest. Ray for Skate I was once in the Percy, you may recall, with brothers William and George and Paul. Lining we was, and there came a day when we hauled in a hundred stone of Ray. This would, of course, have been very nice if we only had managed a decent price, but the market flopped, and truth to tell, the fish we landed we couldn't sell. We'll have to dump them, said George to Paul. We don't seem to do nothing right at all. Well, I shouldn't dump them, said Peter Lou. No ark, and I'll tell you what to do. We'll hire Bob Pollard's horse and cart, load up the fish, and off we'll start. Then Cameron Rage, without a doubt, we'll soon be home, and all sold out. So off we goes, Pete, Paul and George, on through the land, and past the forge, through hell and on past Connors down, to arrive at last at Cameron Town. And all along our weary way we kept on calling, Ray, 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 till quite fed up we wondered why nobody seemed to want to buy. There came a time when quite worn out we took a rest and ceased to shout, when one lone woman, quite perchance, into the basket paused to glance. Well, well, she said, this is a treat. I dearly love a bit of skate. Then Paul was just about to say, It didn't skate, my dear, tis Ray. But Peter whispered, Shut your trap, I'll handle this, you hold your yap. If Cambrian women don't like rays, and ask for skate, then skate it is. She found her purse and took the fish, then said, How much do we want for this? To you, says Pete, we say, Bob. Okay, she said, proper job. Then through the streets of Cambrian town, the cry of skate rang up and down. And women came out by the score, bought up the lot and wanted more. Then, thinking of our homes and wives, we turned the horse towards and dives. A good day's work and no mistake, and all by selling Ray for skate.
Happy Dick, revered by all who know him for his practical interpretation of the Christian way of life. Among the characters I knew in days of long ago, some passed as though they'd never been, while others seem to grow more intimate as time goes on, almost as though they'd never gone. I call to mind a dear old saint who trod our streets of yore. His frame was feeble and infirm, his living lean and poor. Yet poverty, nor pain-filled days, could e'er suppress his theme of praise. He peddled wares from door to door, and whether foul and fair, and every small transaction closed with just a word of prayer, committing all with childlike trust to God the Father, kind and just. As rivers flow toward the sea, distress his wayward wind, and every burdened soul in him was sure to find a friend. And where the means beyond him lay, let's talk to Father, he would say. In fellowship his dear old face for very joy would glow, as though he caught the vision fair of heaven here below. How sweet the name, nearer to thee, and happy deck was in his glee. His living was of small concern, his business, Father's will. And though old Dick has crossed the bar, his spirit lingers still. Of meagre means, possessions few, the richer man I never knew. A Cornish Pasty I gaze on thy recumbent form with longing and delight, rejoicing in that I alone may ever hold thee tight. So luscious, warm and fragrant, such delicious rounding curves, with power to meet man's deepest need, and soothe his jaded nerves. Mine, mine alone to have and hold, O true and worthy friend, and though I never see thee more, I love thee to the end. A short week. Polly the parrot, without a doubt, was a clever bird. She would sing and shout, mimic and whistle, and say what cheer, and talk with the speed of an auctioneer. One embarrassing habit the parrot had. She would swear like a trooper. That was bad. Now Nancy was pious and set her mind on teaching the bird to be more refined. But daily the parrot got worse and worse, and even on Sunday would swear and curse. Said Nancy at last with an aching heart, Any more of this, and we'll have to part. Then it came to her mind how every night when she covered the cage and doused the light that never a sound or an oath was heard. None ever could wish for a better bird. Ah, well, says Nancy, if that's the cure, I'll fix it for Sunday, and that's for sure. So the cage was covered all snug and tight with a paisley shawl to obscure the light. And that was how martyrs were left to stand six days a week with a Sunday band, which was just as well as well could be till the parson arrived one day for tea. It was on a Monday the stroke of four, as Nancy opened the outside door for a breath of air. Then what a shock. There, striding along, on the garden walk was old Parson Jones. And then she heard a volley of oaths from that wretched bird. Quicker than thought, she was through the hall, picked up and passing the Paisley shawl, covered the parrot and smoothed her frock, then opened the door to the parson's knock. Come in, make yourself at home, my dear, and set us down in the easy chair. The kettle is on, the tea in the pot, and we'll soon have a nice cup of hot knot. You couldn't have called on a better day. No time like the present, I always say. Then a muffled voice was heard to squeak. A damn short week and no mistake. A bit of no. Pinch me, somebody, pinch me do. I don't believe it can be true. This Janterville cock sure as eggs arm in arm with old Sarah Cleggs. What next is a body going to see? She's old enough to mother he. Hello, you two. Lovely day. Fine-looking couple, I must say. One endearing characteristic of any Cornish fishing community is the prevalent and good-humoured use of nicknames. St. Ives is no exception, and so to the good folk of Down Along, names to remember. Down Along, Ed, and Down Along, like it used to be, my dear. You don't know who your neighbour is today. I do declare, the foreigners have gotten all, but I can mind the time 
When down along was down along, and everything was fine. If you had a bout of colic, or a child was on the way, a friend was always close at hand to help me, night or day, and sometimes setting in the sun outside my cottage door, I close my eyes and picture all the folk I knowed before. I'll sell you, Barber, Captain Spread, I, George, and Anna Stu, Tom Bucket, Henry Gaffey, Willie Bumps, and Peter Lou, Fair Moe and Jimmy Roundy, Georgie Appy, and my D, and fancy I can see them all as plain as plain can be. Bessie Two Thumbs, Polly Wassy, Ape, and Offer Joe, Mary Wilno, Hook and Asher, Nabo, Sammy Poe, Tommy Rio, Dr. Tibble's Ags, and Pokey James. They didn't have much money, but they all had fancy names. Captain Sai and Sire, Mary Moody, Matthew La, Frankie Flip and Billy Bunkin, Donald Rags and Philip Pa, Maddy Paraffin and Gamo, Mulkins, Eggy and Young John. A worthy breed you must allow, I nod every one. Jimmy Stingbum, Uncle Loss, Bob Cush and Dungey Care. Cock Chit Chat, Tommy Callbags, Annie Pacey, Philip Bear. El Farthens, One Eye Barber, Bushy, Boswell, William Blue. Just stick around and sure enough they'll find a name for you. Fat Teddy, Pint and a Penner, Billy Bowler, Tommy Red. Bob Slippery and Jimmy Duck, Snash Knee and Joby Ned. Jan Kid and Minch and Captain Bark, F. Crooks, Jack Fay and Fly. And better known perhaps than most, her old friend Willie Spry. Captain Tarbrush, Tholly Kessie, Pard and Paddy Jimmy Stick. Jan Turk's Grand, Sly Dick and Dose, Johnny Lime and Happy Dick. Sparlock, Mathy Fake and Foxy, Turkey, Tommy Twit, Dick Worm. When you think of all the changes, it's enough to make you squirm. Man Friday, Mikey Noon, Mikey Tinsey, Poogie Daw. Springy Jack and Robert Coddles, Tommy Checky, Jammy Ma. Jimmy Knickerbockers, Kingo, Nicky Chatter, Dicky Bet. If you haven't heard your own name yet, you may do if you wait. Billy Blue Nose, Matthew Gentry, Suki Joe, and Tommy Finch. Any Moocher, Polly Cuckoo, Tommy Rackey, Humphrey Inch. Pad Naff and Georgie Bunny, Cover, Granfer's Clock and Pet. But wait a bit, there's more to come, I haven't finished yet. Matthew Medler, Georgie Belty, Dillica and Darkey. Little Pilcher, Henry Gabba, Mina, Willie Markey. Curly Casper, Alibut Dick, Jack Hammer, Tank and Nigger. Jam Pasty coming on behind to make the party bigger. Tonky Topper, Prime and Floppers, Shiner, Raddy and Dick Try. Lizzie Wilgie, Charlie Dryfoot, Dash and Billow and Shanghai. Bristol Jim and Any Puddy, Vigil Lights and Clear of Flow. Not forgetting Katie Fashions, all dressed up, nowhere to go. Janie Fuggins, Ali Sloper, Bessie Roughneck, Atty Cock. Annie Tail Leaves, Hockey Living, Robert Sloggs and Annie Dock. Old Sale, Billy Dan, Shaler, Bob Quint, Burps and Yankee Jack. Went abroad to make his fortune, glad to work his passage back. Scrounger, Sligo, Buddy Cooch, Dick Everywhere, Jan Shea. Frozen Glass and Fanny Tooks, Bill Tozzle and Kit Ray. Sunshine, Wuzzy Wimbush, Winkle, Smuts and Pickin' In. Like sausages, some short and thick, and others long and thin. Peter Bark, Johnny Bolo, Lady Actress, Cherry Ripe. Old Dick Salt, a good egg wasted, I like jam, cheese and tripe. Luggers, Tommy Puffer, Tilchem, Nymph, Cock Rubin, Gull, my Joan. Ah, my dear, this generation soon will all be dead and gone. To you, my dear, they may be names, just names and nothing more. To me, they represent the good, old-fashioned days of yore. Hard, poverty-stricken, happy days. To you, this may seem queer, but down long, Ed, and down long. Like it used to be, my dear. A silent miracle. Could just as well a berry be, a thistle or a rose. The same deep mystery abides with everything that grows. Each recreated entity, in colour, form and line, a perfect soul expression of meticulous design. Pure concentrate of latent power, innate in every seed. It falls alike the healing herb, the coarse and rancid weed. The inner life that moulds the tree, majestic, broad and tall, with equal skill and care sustains the infinitely small. The attributes of heaven and earth in harmony combine to consummate the purpose set in nature's grand design. The cosmic rays of light and heat with soft, refreshing shower contribute to the artistry, implicit in a flower. The humble seedling, lost to sight in earth's absorbent breast, 
a silent miracle achieves at deity's behest. Inherent in each tiny cell the germ of ancient lore still coexists with that which is and all that lies before. A universe inscrutable, exquisitely expressed in glorious ubiquity, its beauty manifests a sense in things inanimate, as by divine command, growth, procreation and repair move forward hand in hand. The Other Man John Stone turned in on a certain night with a man just as black as he was white, after leaving a note to be called in time to be on his job at the stroke of nine. John offended the chambermaid, it seems, so when he had entered the land of dreams, she crept into his room like a little slut and blackened his face with a coated soot. On his way to work, it was quite by chance that into a mirror he paused to glance, and the face he saw wasn't his at all. It was just as black as a no call. He was puzzled at first. Then he says, says he, hey, they've called the darky instead of me. So the problem solved and nothing to lose. He went back to bed for another snooze. Bed and breakfast. I couldn't help hearing t'other day what some of our women had to say, sitting down there on the friendship spar. <laughs> what gossipy creatures these women are. It was Anna Maria, it seems to me, who started the topic on bed and bee, droning on in her sing-song way. This was near enough what she had to say. Ah, well, you know it is, my dear. The same people come year after year till they aren't like visitors anymore. They just drive up and knock the door. And when I open up, they stand looking at me, kissing and all smiling like, as though to say, you wouldn't turn your friends away, would you, my dear? And so it goes, says I, you better come in, I suppose. I see how it is, says Meg Tremere. Tend the money you want, my dear. You mean to say you aren't like we who take in folk for bed and be, just for to earn a quid or two. Oh, no, my dear, we aren't like you. We merely work for selfish ends. You just oblige your paying friends. That's it exactly, Anna said. You hit the nail right on the head. Well, well, says Peggy, what a laugh. Your old man's bed is in the bath, and just to let one single more, you kept down on the kitchen floor. And then, and I know this is true, you even cut your eggs in too. Now you've got the cheek to say you work for fun and we for pay. Come now, says little Martha Prout, you mustn't have no falling out. There's nothing wrong with a bit of coos, but tempers we must never lose. It's one thing, though, I know for sure, that had no picnic any more. Last week, when leaning on the Epps, a geek car stopped along my steps. Out got a bloke and said to me, Is that your sign for bed and bee? Whose else, says I, do you presume? Would you like to come in and see the room? And then, says he, and I had a laugh, I hope you've got a shower and bath. Says I, we haven't got none of they, but there's plenty of water in the sea. Then he put his backside on the bed to test the spring show, as he did. He wanted early morning tea. Did I have an extra key? Then after I had shortened through, he fussed about the outside low. I felt I couldn't stand no more, and all but shoved him through the door. At last he said, all so polite, what is your cheapest rate per night? Ah, well, that all depends, I said, on how long you require the bed. Says he, well, if your charge is right, I may decide to stay the night. You ought to have heard me telling off. I said, you call yourself a tough, but if you can afford my price, you'll find the chapel very nice. Just stretch out on the bench or floor, all needs provided, free, next door. Without a word, he took his hat and went off like a scalded cat. The primitive. Art's primitive, traditional, contemporary too, have found a place in old St. Tives for one and all to view. Rare genius once here abode, thrice honoured be his name, whose works of art now widely known adorn the halls of fame. Quite late in life, from work retired, with aught to do but rest, he quit his cottage on the wharf for one at Back Road West. Here, proximate to his retreat, in culture poles apart, a dedicated group contrived to cultivate their art. While Alf, untutored and aloof, with oddments cheap and crude, unhampered by the rules of art, his lonely course pursued. His subjects ranged from fish to birds, boats, people, sea and shore. His transposition quite unique, 
Perspective, back to four. There came a day when once a year the veil was drawn apart, that one and all might enter free the higher realms of art. Alf watched the crowds go flocking by, his neighbours' works to view. I think, says he, next year I'll stage an exhibition too. Another year sped swiftly by, when pictures by the score adorned the humble little room beyond Alf's cottage door. He sadly watched the curious few who paused to stare a while, and wondered why the whispered jest, the supercilious smile. By nature moody and reserved, and rather lonely too, detached and sensitive, his choice of intimates were few. A little approbation may have set his spirit free and brought him joy, but ere it came, old Alf had ceased to be. As he had lived, so Alfred died, a man unknown to fame. His pictures few had even thought it worth their wild acclaim, till some discerning eye perceived an outline crude and bold, rare master strokes of genius, all worth their weight in gold. Alf Wallace, primitive, unique, all honour to his name, a simple man whose works of art adorn the halls of fame. All this, and suitably inscribed where rests his hoary brow, the tribute so desired in life, too late to serve him now. A rainy day. He was always a quiet sort of chap, uh, though as deep as the whiskey bay. We nodden as one who had no to spear, and little enough to say, but if ever a thing were Harry Freeze, there was never a doubt or fear, you could safely wager your Sunday shirt who would call her the lion's here? He took the fish in the same as we, uh, and we soon got his measure then, for he always was butter or back a short, and would scrounge off the other men. But if ever a thing you forgot yourself and you mentioned your lapse of mind, he was up on deck like a scalded cat uh, with a gale of wind behind. He went on through life, right to journey's end in the same little narrow way, holding a trifle here and there, as he thought, for a rainy day. A few figures scrawled in a little book, just a record of joys denied, and that was the substance of his account when the poor old scrounger died. Father and Son Old William lived in Cable Court, called Puddin' Bag Lane it was. They'd care the place old-fashioned now, I suppose, and just because the little lane is narrow-like, with cobblestones and all, and cellar doors below the steps all tarred as black as coal. Twas in one way and out the same, no room for horse and carts, <laughs> but a brave safe place for children you to play in, <laughs> bless their hearts. And William loved the children as he did, and no mistake, and you should see the Jonas that the dear old chap would make. The kids would crowd around him, and he'd turn and twist his knife, until the block of wood he carved would seem to come to life. And poetry, how oh, I dare me, Bill Shakespeare wasn't in it. Earl William, he would make a rhyme, and wouldn't take a minute. He was a card, though, as he was, and so was his boy John. It would make his cut your sides, it would the way they'd carry on. They had a little handy boat, just nicely built for two. So Jan and Feather William went together as a crew. But what to name the little craft was anybody's guess, till William said to Jan one day, Now what we'll do is this. Just think no more about it, Jan, but leave it to the Lord, and kill her for the first prime fish that we may haul aboard. So leave go for it, cast off aft, and though a name we lack, with any luck at all, my boy, she'll have one coming back. They shot their lines, then went to haul, when up a turbot came. And that was how L. William solved the problem of a name. And I recall when we were boys and they would come to land, we'd quit our games with one accord and race across the sand. And then old William, he would say, Launch up, boys, come on. And he would make the muster like, wink his eye to John. If William nodded our little game, it happened every time. And so he'd say, Well, launch her up and you shall have a rhyme. So while we pulled, old William would be working with his head. And when we got her on her junks, his little piece, he said, his verse would always take the cake for humour, wit and spice. And never would the old chap stoop to tell the same rhyme twice. His daughter was a rhymester too. And many is the time when Father William and Jeanette would correspond in rhyme. Now a certain winter season had been worn of fruitless toil. And every shot the turbot made, the laws of chance would fall. 
Day after day the wind would blow with driving sleet and rain, so William brought his daughter in the following refrain. Dear Jeanette, the season is up, and I've lunched up the boat, but the weather is cold, how I long for a coat. When Janet got the card next day, she made reply without delay, Dear Feather, your note received and not in vain, I am sending a coat by the two o'clock train. Now William often would ignore Dame Nature's warning voice, and put to sea when into port were far the wiser choice. And so it happened now and then, when things got out of hand, a larger boat would have to tow the turbot back to land. Then there would be some caught in when old William showed his face, uh, but he would listen to it all and suffer no disgrace. And once when they were pressing like belong for some retort, the old man said, Well, if I must, I'll give thee my report. Early one morning, struggling for meat, we went out in the turbot to fish for a skate. A skate we caught, but oh so thin. Our anchor rope parted, and we were towed in. And then there was that other time. It was quite a latish hour. The town's gone to roost except for groups of three or four. Who after supper every night would take a little walk and meet along the harbour front where they would stand and talk. Well, on the night I have in mind, the moon was shining bright. Never could a mortal wish to see a fairer sight. And so thought John and William rowing home across the bay, with scant returns to recompense their labours of the day. It was just about low water when the turbot tapped the shore, which meant a weary wet on tide till twelve o'clock or more, unless, of course, by some device that only William knew, the threes and fours could be induced to form a launch and crew. And then all on a sudden like the quiet air was rent, with loud alarming shouts and cries of anger and lament, and threes and fowers were on the run to where the turbot lay, had fallen over chains and stones with growls of wild dismay. A shame on you to strike your feather, what a row it was for sure. Shut your trap, boy, John retorted. I don't want to hear no more. One to port, one to starboard, each a lunch and grip in hand, kept abusing one another till the boat was fully manned. Never was a boat launched faster than the turbot was that night. Soon she lay upon her moorings, Rope secured, all snug and tight. Thank you, men, the row's all over. Uh, that was all old William said. Come stone further, says the youngster. Let's go on home and get to bed. What a laugh there was next morning, telling how they'd all been done. Them were days of simple pleasures, little cash, but loads of fun. And I sometimes pause to wonder whether our newfangled ways really make life any richer than it was in olden days. These old chaps were hard and hearty, frugal to the point of need, giving thanks for food and shelter, kind alike in thought and deed, felt distress with one another, worked together, shared success, seeking only to be happy, nothing more and nothing less. A typical pet leg pull, improving the vision. Pet and Pete stood on the foredeck, peering through the mist. Old Pet was busy counting boats, and spun off quite a list, while Captain Pete of any boats saw not a single sign. At last he said to Pet, Maybe your sight is better than mine, but what I fail to understand is how you come to see so many boats when none at all are visible to me. Ah, well, says Pet, I'll tell you how. First take a bit of rope, then wet the end and rub hard upon a cake of soap. Then take the glasses off your eyes and smear them good and well. Then put them on. There you are. There's nothing more to tell. Old Captain Pete, though much impressed, would make no move as yet. Too many men had come to grief through taking tips from Pet. Pet still was looking quite intent at objects far and near. Didn't even seem to know that Captain Pete was there. Then quietly he turned aside, cut off a bit of rope. Then told the boy to go below and hand him up the soap. His glasses smeared, he put them on, and then, and this is true, not only could he see the boats, but read their numbers too. Too much for Captain Pete was this. He shouted down to Dick, Hand up the cake of soap, my boy, and hurry, make it quick. The soap applied and glasses fixed, he strained with furrowed brow, then said to Pet, Strange to me, I don't see nothing now. Dick must have given you washing soap, I expect, was Pet's retort. There's soap and soap, you know, my cabin. Must have the proper sort. A 
thought for the new year. If a certain thing you do inclines at all to worry you, then stop it. That barrier that lies between the man you are and might have been, just drop it. If you would learn to comprehend the power that makes of life a friend, let conscience guide you round the bend, try Everest and top it.